Let's talk the New York football giants, shall we? And this is a team that I'll admit I actually have a bet on already, and we'll get to that in just a second. But it is a team that last year, the total DVOA, 31st in the NFL, the DVOA on the offense, 32nd in the NFL. So it was not good last year by any stretch of the imagination. That being said, Stephen, they go out. We have in a completely new coaching staff in Brian Dayball as the new head coach coming over as the, uh, from the Buffalo bills as their offensive coordinator, a guy that has been highly sought after a guy that has been very, very well respected in the NFL. They bring in Mike Kafka as the, as the offensive coordinator. Where was he? Oh, by the way, he was just the quarterback's coach over in Kansas city. They got a pretty good dude over there in Patrick Mahomes. And then, what I think was a very uh, huge hire. I think it was a huge mistake on Baltimore's uh, part by getting rid of Wink Martindale. But hey, that is a bonus for this New York football Giants team in Wink Martindale coming over as the defensive coordinator. So I don't think we can even overstate, Steve. Now, let's not, we'll, we'll get to the personnel in just a second. But just the jump alone in the coaching staff from last year to the coaching staff from this year might be one of the biggest jumps in coaching staffs in maybe the history of the NFL going from <laughs> one staff to a new staff. And Brian Dayball's never even coached a, a day of, of, of football for, as a head coach in his life. But I, I feel that confidently with the, with the clowns that were there last year to what they have this year in, in Dayball, who again, I'm no, you know, I'm no scout. I've never coached in the NFL, but everyone that has and everyone that does thinks that this guy's the real deal and thinks that he is truly going to be something special. Kafka coming over after working with Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City and then Wink Martindale with his just years and years and years and years of experience here. The, the turnover for the Giants. If you're a Giants fan alone, that should at least give you some hope heading into this season. To your point about the ineptitude of this franchise from both a coaching staff situation and the front office, five straight years this team has gone under the win total. And at no point over the past five years did they have a winning record. Not for, not not even like 1-0 and oh, did they have a winning record. They're the only team in the NFL where that's been the case. So I, I do love Brian Dable. Like I've joked in our in our slacks that, you know, he's God. That he's right. God Dable. Like you love Jesus H. Burrow. I'm a fan of God Dable. So this guy, I think, is a prime candidate for a coach of the year award here. He's among the favorites. But if you look at recent history of this award, since 2010, Mike Vrabel last year was the first coach of the year on a team with a double digit win total. But take into account that there was an extra game last year. So, and also since 2010, all but the last two coaches of the year exceeded their win total by four plus games. So we're looking for a coach with that upward mobility and the opportunity to vastly exceed expectation. And since 2010, all but one coach of the year had a win total of at least seven. So we're looking in that seven to nine and a half range. Well, it turns out there's two head coaches in the NFC East that fall into that category. Nick Sirianni with the Eagles, but also Brian Dable with the Giants, who has a win total of seven. But it's Dable that has the easiest schedule in the NFL this year based on opponent win totals. So there is potential here for him to vastly exceed this win total just based on how easy the schedule looks. And over six and a half is minus 135 at Ben MGM. Over seven wins is plus 105, still available on the market. I like that plus money. The real question here, Matt, is, is this coaching upgrade enough in year one to overcome the just complete mess that is this roster? And that, you know, some of the, some people on our staff are bullish on this team doing big things at big numbers when it comes to futures. I can't really get there in year one beyond just the win total. Yeah, I mean, so look, the there are some pretty key players. I know you're saying key players from a four win team, but there, there were some pretty, there are some pretty key players that are out of town, right? Evan Ingram's gone. Jamie Bradbury has gone. Austin Johnson is gone. Lorenzo Carter is gone. Jabril Peppers is gone. Will Hernandez is gone. Logan Ryan is gone. So there's a lot of guys that I, I understand you're saying, Hey dude, they only, they only won four games last year as it was anyway. Still, those are some key players. Those are some good players. They're going to go and they're going to have, they're going to have good years elsewhere. 
what did they bring in? They did bring in a right guard, Mike Glowinski, who's going to start for them, who's been a super, super solid guy in the NFL. They brought in a solid backup quarterback in Terod Taylor to back up Daniel Jones in case he either one of two things is absolutely horrible and they go have to they go ahead and have to just make a a switch or if he does happen to get hurt somewhere along the way. It wasn't really what they did so much in free agency than what they did in the draft that is also, I think, fairly impressive uh, for this team. So they had they were one of multiple teams that had two first-round picks. Steven, they go out with the fifth overall pick and get Tavon, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, and with the seventh overall pick, get Evan Neal. These are two different players that at some point or another leading into the draft process were the favorites to go number one overall in the draft, and they got two of these guys with mm-hmm. their number five and number seven pick. They have an instant impact guy on the defensive line, an instant impact guy on the offensive line, and then go out with their second round pick and get Wandale Robinson as a guy who I believe is, yes, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve for him. A lot of people were saying that it's a little bit of a raw skill set that does have a ton of upside here. But again, I like the pick. I like them kind of swinging for the fences on stuff like that. You come back with the two third round picks and take an offensive guard and a corner. I think that what they did in the draft as well did make this team better. I think what this all just comes down to, if you kind of look top to bottom, Stephen, for me, it's just, it's what can Daniel Jones do, right? I mean, can, yep. is Daniel Jones, is he at all good or is he just complete gutter trash? And here's the thing is, I don't think it's fair for us to judge whether he's gutter trash or not from the body of work that he's put together so far, because like you mentioned, this has been one of the most inept franchises with the most inept coaching staffs in the NFL over the last several seasons. So I can't hold it completely against Daniel Jones that that he is just you know the worst quarterback we've ever seen and what a bust he is, et cetera, et cetera, because I don't know for sure he's been given a fair shake. I do believe this coaching staff is the coaching staff to give him a fair shake. And so if he's terrible this year, then I think we can go ahead and write him off and say, okay, Daniel Jones isn't the dude. But you look around and you've got Ricky Seals-Jones and, and Kenny Galladay and Kadarius Toney and Sterling Shepard and Wandell. you got Slayton still there as well. you got Wandell Robinson. You, you still you have Saquon Barkley who says he's healthy. There is a lot going right for Daniel Jones here, and if he can't get it done, then maybe yes, he is just a, a giant bust. To me, it's kind of similar to to Jalen Hurts in the first year of the coaching staff last year, where you know I basically call that his rookie season. Mm-hmm. I'm basically going to call this the rookie season for Daniel Jones because I do agree with you that he was put in a situation where. It, it was almost impossible not to fail with how just awful the front office and the coaching staff was. And the, the statistics back that up in terms of stable stats, where he ranked in EPA per attempt, 35th, there's only 32 teams in the league, 35th on early downs without play action, 31st on first downs in the first three quarters, 28th on layup throws. So those stats do concern me because those I feel like are stats that he can control. Um, but even in the less sticky stats, he, he still wasn't good, obviously. 24th or worse when under pressure, outside the pocket, play action, when being blitzed. He was 32nd in fourth quarter EPA per attempt and went on the move. So what is improvement and is that enough improvement is my question here. Because it's unrealistic to think that just because Brian Dable made Josh Allen look like a bad quarterback and made him into the, you know the best in the league, one of the best in the league, I don't think that's a realistic expectation for Daniel Jones. I think it's unfair to cherry pick training camp videos, but for what it's worth, we have seen more horrifically bad training camp videos of Daniel Jones than we've seen highlight throws of him since this camp has opened with Brian Dable. So I think there's going to be a learning curve here. I don't think he's going to go from one of the worst passers in the league to above average. I think it's a Jalen Hurts situation where maybe he can kind of be middle of the road. And is the rest of this roster around him good enough to win the division at long odds or make a run in the playoffs? Maybe they sneak into the playoffs with the, the easiest schedule in the league. But to me, the, that's, that's it. Like, that's the ceiling. And you saw what happened with the Eagles in their, in their playoff game against the Buccaneers last year. They couldn't move the ball. So... Um, that's kind of where I'm at. They're, they're seventh in the league with the most dead cap space on the salary cap and the players they have left on the roster 
really aren't elite either. So there's not really much there to help Daniel Jones. Yeah, so for me, I played the all over on this team. So I played over eight at plus two fifteen. I think that eight is a fair it's a fair number for this squad. I'm talking about an under five. I'm talking about an under five hundred team, and I can still get a push here. A, a nine win team if they can get above five hundred, and I'm going to cash a plus two fifteen ticket. Here's my breakdown. One, it's that easiest schedule that you're talking about, and I think it's probably even easier than than what we're looking at from the advanced stats right now, because me personally, I'm further down on Tennessee than most people are. They kick off the season against Tennessee. Now it is at Tennessee, but I'm, I'm further down on the Titans than most people are. I think that is a very winnable game for this team. Carolina's not going to have it all figured out by week two. They play Carolina week two, Chicago in week four is going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL. If not the worst team in the NFL, they still play Jacksonville. They still play Seattle. They still play Houston. They still play Detroit. They get two games against Washington. And I am really looking at 10 winnable games for this for this squad here. And I only need them to win, you know, nine of those games. And they're going to surprise in one of these games somewhere along the way as well. Maybe they upset Dallas. Maybe they upset a Minnesota. Maybe they upset uh, one of these one of these teams that we think is going to be good that maybe not Minnesota I'm you know a little bit higher on but maybe they're not as good this year as, as we think so I, I am I I took I played the alt over here and I feel pretty good about it uh, you know listen is it a likely push it does eight and nine seem about right for this team it does but if they can overachieve just a little bit Steven I'm going to cash a plus 215 ticket and that's kind of how I like to play the Giants this year Here's what I'm really curious about. And I agree with everything you just said, but schematically on offense, this is what I'm curious about. I do think the offensive line should be better than what's on paper this year. They were already mm. above average in, one, in run block win rate last year. They added Evan Neal at the top of the first round, and they have three new interior offensive linemen. Maybe Saquon Barkley stays healthy this year. So all that sounds good for a run game that should help Daniel Jones. But will Brian Dable actually run the ball heavier? Will he adapt and and to his personnel as opposed to the opposite of what we saw with Arthur Smith being run heavy to a fault? Will he be pass heavy to a fault from what his days were in Buffalo? So that's what I'm going to be really looking for early in the season. Will Dable adjust his pass tendencies based on his new personnel here? If he does, I think that should keep the Giants in more games, especially early in the season, um, because the passing game, I think, is going to take some time for Daniel Jones to learn this offense and figure things out. The secondary lost James Bradbury. They have a bunch of number two corners now that are they're highly questionable. Darnay Holmes was 93rd among cornerbacks by PFF if he had enough snaps to grade in there. Um, the front seven was bottom five and opponent rush yards before contact. So they couldn't stop the run. Some promising signs there for maybe a pass rush. But um, yeah, I think I think if Dable is smart, he slows these games down, reduces possessions to maybe increase some variance here where they can come out on the on the right side of it in some of these games. You can find 150 to one on the Giants to win the Super Bowl. And I'm not advocating for making that bet. What I will say is that's an off market number. You can go to the lines.com. You can look at our odds comparison tool. There's an 85 to one out there, Steven. There's a 66 to one out there, Steven, for the Giants to win the Super Bowl, while there's also a 150 to one getting hung. Sometimes we make bets just because numbers are so incredibly off market. Yeah. And all we need is a team to get in the tournament. We saw Cincinnati last year. They got in the tournament. They got hot. They made a run. 150 to one, again, is, is an interesting number for a team that plays in such a weak division. Plus 575 is the best number you're going to find on them to, to win the division. So, again, uh, New York football giants, I think you and I both are at least a little bit higher on them, or at least the potential for this team in a division that is going to be down in a schedule that should be the easiest in the NFL.